Hey there guys, welcome to ABC News Highlights. My name is Nana Kwame Bobe. My name is Mova Abadai and on top of the story for the day. So the Ghana Statistical Service is saying that two-thirds of Ghanaians are in vulnerable employment. The government statistician of the Ghana Statistical Service, Professor Samuel Kovnaini, has revealed that a significant portion of the employed population, specifically two-thirds, is engaged in vulnerable employment. Addressing Ghana's escalating employment rate of 14.7% during an interview on the City Breakfast Show, uh, Professor Enim expressed concern the situation might be more challenging than unemployment figures suggest. He highlighted that a substantial portion of those employed in the Ghanaian economy face vulnerabilities in their employment status. And I'm quoting, when it comes to the Ghanaian economy, of those who are employed, two-thirds are in vulnerable employment. We have about 20,000 people who have been unemployed for a period of the seven quarters that we have. And if you take the last six months, we have in excess of 1.3 million people who have stayed unemployed. So, Nana, you may be employed, but you are vulnerable. Two thirds of the population. People have been unemployed for seven quarters. That is serious. It is very serious. It says a lot about, you know, the situation in the country and how things are going. Mm -hmm. and yes. I, I have a feeling that majority of them will be reached. Of course. Definitely, definitely. And I think it's scary that as um, cost of living skyrockets, you would think that a job security would be one of the best things to have. But if two thirds exactly. of the employed population... How do we survive? How do we survive? That is a question, and you guys, if you have the answer, let us know or ask um, and comment what your thoughts are on this particular glaring and daring statistics, because it is it is really, really scary. We are moving on to our next story, and the President, His Excellency Nana Abdanko Kufaro, is set to deliver his State of the Nation address on the 27th of February, which is meant to be his last before um, he peacefully hands over power um, post the 2024 general elections. Well. As the president prepares to deliver his State of the Nation address to Parliament, Franklin Kujo, who is the president of Imani Africa, has urged him not to offer any excuses and that he should be bold enough to extend an apology to Ghanaians. According to him, and I quote, his last State of the Nation address is expected to be full of flowery praises, which is anticipated, but he should be bold enough to apologize to us. He is the one who should extend an apology rather than Baonia, so that people will at least understand them. So according to Franklin Kujo, the state of the economy must be accounted for. And as somebody that has been president, has been lord of all affairs, because you're the president of the nation, you should come. And maybe for once, do not praise yourself, do not make excuses, whether with COVID, whether the Ukraine-Russian war, do not make excuses and just say, maybe things didn't turn out right or didn't go out the way I expected it to go. So Ghanaians. My fellow Ghanaians, I am sorry. And that is coming from Franklin Kujo. I don't think that is bad advice. Just because you apologize doesn't mean nothing. Mm. You may have had, you know, a set plan and you didn't exactly go that way. So, yes, we want to hear if you've done things. Okay, so government has done this, that, 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 that. Okay, we said we would do this, that, that. We couldn't do it. Apologize, you know, maybe you should give us another chance. We'll do better. Or even in our last month, we I mean, that comes off as truthful rather than maybe you haven't done anything and then you come and tell us that, okay, we've done this, we've done that. That would just, you know, annoy people. Well, um, I think Valmia's letter sort of foreshadows the achievements he would, he would speak of that day or he would boast of that day. Um, I don't think this government believes, like Franklin Kujo or any other person, believes that they have not necessarily performed to power. Do you think they have done everything? Obviously. Don't you think that? That the people's opinion is what you 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 should hold in hand and say, okay, you may think we have done this, but if the population is saying that, we need to you know look at the things they are complaining about. Absolutely, two thirds are unemployed. Exactly, and many more other um glaring problems. But twenty seventh is right here by the corner. We will let you know and update you whenever he comes to speak and if he speaks like the way Franklin Kujua Abba suggest he should. On to the story for the day. So still on the president, he has appointed caretaker ministers. So the president, Tekufuadu, has assigned additional responsibilities 
to some ministers to fill vacancies in various ministries without substantive ministers. The president did his first major reshuffle on Wednesday, February 14, entirely taking some ministers of his government while reassigning some to other ministries. Among the notable assignments, we have the railway minister, John Pita Abewu, who will temporarily oversee the Sanitation and Water Resources Ministry until Lady Aseram Al Hassan completes her vetting process, which is yet to be you know, determined. In a similar move, Interior Minister Henry Korte will manage the Greater Accra region until Ni Kwate's height as Global assumes the position of Greater Accra Regional Minister. Then we have Kojo Ponkoma, the Minister of Works and Housing, will continue to assume the responsibilities of the Information Ministry until his deputy, his former deputy, Mrs. Fatima Tuabubaka, is vetted and approved by Parliament. So it continues, and then you know the people. Now here it says, um, uh, the Communications Ministry, that's Esla Uswe Kufu, has been assigned to take charge of the Health Ministry until Dr. Bernard Oku Boy is officially sworn in as Minister. I'm trying to understand some of the caretaking responsibilities. Why is a Minister for Communication um, a caretaker for, you know, the Ministry of Health? You couldn't find someone who has, maybe, I don't know if Esla has a background, but I mean, someone who has had experience there to, you know, manage to you swear in whoever is, you know. Valid questions, really? if you're asking. Yeah, very valid questions. I think it would make sense for you to tell me that Joe Bonkoma is, you know, still manning the ministry. He already must tell whoever is taking place takes place. That makes sense. For someone from a completely different sector, you know, handling. Um, that is a bit, it's like, I saw one too about how I come the minister of fisheries, finish, uh, fi, uh, sorry, the fisheries minister who handle the ministry of gender, children, and social protection. Why isn't there someone else who can do that? Um, very valid questions, but what really strikes me more is the fact that this process is supposed to take quite some time. You know, vetting and going through that before that swanning. And you have how many months before you leave office? So you're asking what's the point of the reshuffle? I'm asking <laughs> how much would they be able to do in the time that seems so limited for them to work, guys. Let us know what you that think. Is very valid. Exactly. Let us know what you think. And we're moving on to our next story. So free SH as well. It's been one of the most, um, what, problematic policies. It has helped a lot of people, but it's constantly in the news. People are asking for us to reconsider. People are asking, um, even if it was worth it because the state of education in this country is not of the best quality. Well, Education Think Tank, African Education Watch, has urged the government to reconsider its free SHS policy, proposing that parents opting to have their children reside in a boarding house should be responsible for covering the associated fees. In a financial burden analysis of the free SHS policy and implications of the equitable access, Edward Watch recommended that a free boarding secondary education should be reserved for students in undeserved communities. The study, which was commissioned by the Africa Education Watch with support from Osfam as part of the Danida Strategic Partnership 2 project, explained that allowing parents to pay will allow the government to generate some revenue to complement the free SHS. In the medium long term, the MOE must develop and implement a strategy to gradually transition Ghana's secondary school system from the current boarding as a norm to a day to day as a norm. So basically, free boarding secondary school should reserve strategically for students in undeserved communities where there is no reasonable commutable access to secondary school. So what, um, what basically what they're saying is, Free SHS, when it comes to free boarding SHS, should be reserved to undeserved, com undeserved communities, poor communities, um, communities that do not have much to pay and also have like bad transportation system where people can't transport themselves or their kids to school. But in secondary schools in the city, in the more metropolitan areas, if you want to take a child to a boarding house, you should be able to pay for the fees. No, no, I think I am not the only one. Many people have had this opinion. Mm. That if parents can pay for their children to get the kind of education they want their children to have, they should pay for it. Yes. Because obviously, you know, when you come up with a policy or a project you want to embark on, you do a survey, you seek opinions, and you find that, okay, maybe realistically, this is not so achievable. So why don't we do this portion this way? Why don't we do that portion? And obviously, there are millions of students who go to school. If you do not have the capacity to take care of all of them, understand that let parents pay for children, those who can afford it. So that, exactly, those who cannot afford it, you know, enjoy, you know, their education also. But if the rich is enjoying, the poor is also in money. That's true. What's the point of the policy? So now, if in case they do restructure it and say, well, if you're going to take your child to boarding school, then, then pay. What happens to 
students from um, more humble backgrounds going to school outside of town, outside of their city of residence, outside their town of residence that can't afford to pay. Will this um, policy restructuring be um, evidence through the process of giving kids school? When you are deciding to um, allocate schools to kids, would you say, how are you even going to consider okay, that? How, yeah, how do you know that okay, this, this person can't afford to go out of town? Okay, that is something that we need Exactly, to because we can also say they should now go to their school when they say come from a course when yeah, they come into yes. a second across. That is, that is a valid thought process. So I think, yeah. yes, we need to figure out how who are the children yes. who actually need, you know, the help and the education. So that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. But do let us know what you think. You think that children who come from out to do homes should have their parents paying for the education while, you know, those who come from, from more humble backgrounds, you know, enjoy the benefits that come with free education. This has been ABC News Highlights. My name is Olga Abadai. And my name is Nana Kwame Brother. For more details, please visit abcnewsgate.com or social media handles, abcnewsgate underscore. See you.